Hello, I'm Charles Curtis, Australasia's passion provocateur. Welcome to this week's episode of the Charles Curtis Show, episode 173. Whether you're watching on YouTube or on Rumble or listening via podcast from one of the many potential platforms. In this week's episode, I discuss the recent visit to Melbourne, Australia of the President of Hungary, Kotalin Novak. I met her at a commemoration event in Melbourne on Sunday the 22nd of October that was commemorating the commencement of the Hungarian uprising against Russia on October 23, 1956. There was a huge crowd of local Hungarians present on this day. The president spoke powerfully and inspirationally about Hungary's fight for freedom in the past and its ongoing fight for freedom. In this week's show, I quote extensively from Greg Sheridan's article in the Australian newspaper, a Murdoch publication, that reported on his long interview with Kotalin Novak. There are great lessons to be learnt from this interview. Firstly, having the courage to live your life in accordance with your faith and your values. Secondly, having the courage to speak your own truth. Thirdly, having the courage to push back against the views of a majority of leftist, liberal narrative that dominates Western mainstream media. Finally, I discuss the rewards that flow from such acts of courage. Our format for the show is that I discuss a big idea, I share some resources with you to implement ideas that rise for you from the big idea. Thirdly, I review some key happenings during the week. And lastly, for new viewers and listeners, I explore the foundational principles for this show and more details about my background. So let's go with today's big idea. The President of Hungary, Kotalin Novak, a 46-year-old mother of three, visited Melbourne, Australia recently. There are lessons to be learnt from what she shared while she was in Melbourne. She was here to commemorate the commencement of the Hungarian uprising against the Russian takeover of Hungary. That was on October 23, 1956. There was a huge crowd in Melbourne. 23 October was the uprising of the people against the might of Russia. And this uprising, which had which had a potential for succeeding, was in fact unceremonially squashed on the 4th of November. Bear in mind that this was some three weeks before the commencement of the Melbourne Olympics of 1956, where the whole Hungarian team was already in Melbourne and this uprising was happening. 4th of November, it was squashed. Communism reasserted its control and dominance of Hungary. I want to quote to you extensively from Greg Sheridan's article, which reported on his interview of Kotalin Novak. Greg Sheridan writes for the Australian newspaper, part of the Rupert Murdoch empire. The title of the article is Hungary's President Places Her Faith in a Better Nation. The subtitle, Don't Buy the Liberal Line. Kotalin Novak says, We're for freedom, family and Christian tradition. Now, there's some quite extensive quotes, but I, I thought I couldn't do better than to read this, and it's worth understanding what what Hungary is all about and the lessons to be learned from it. She says, in Hungary, we have zero tolerance of anti-Semitism. We stood after the Hamas invasion with Israel and with the Jewish people. We have a very strong Jewish community in Hungary. They enjoy complete rights and freedoms. In Hungary, Jewish people are always telling me that they never have to be worried about wearing a Jewish yarmulke in public or expressing their Jewishness. Hungarian Jews are not harassed on the street or subject to assault or vandalism, a marked contrast to the situation in some other European nations, especially France and Britain. Sheridan writes, yet there's a single weird trope about the Orban government, Viktor Orban is the Prime Minister of Hungary, 
it's that it is anti-Semitic. This seems to come entirely from Orban's dislike of George Soros, a billionaire who funds left liberal causes around the world and happens to be Jewish. By the way, I'm uh, totally opposed to the activity of, jo of George Soros as well. Sheridan writes, back in, in 2019, I asked the Orthodox chief rabbi in Budapest, Shlomo Koves, ha, same name as me, except with one S, not two. Shlomo Koves, whether Jews, that, by the way, that's pronounced in Hungarian as Koves, whether Jews felt unhappy in Hungary and whether they were subject to ongoing anti-Semitism. Shlomo responded, quote, Hungary's Jewish community is one of the safest and best treated in Europe, he replied. Many in the Western media call the Hungarian government extreme right-wing and anti-Semitic. In my view, this is total nonsense and just part of the language game of left liberals. Back to Novak, says Sheridan. She says, I am a mother, a wife, a Hungarian, a Christian believer. These all define me and I can't put them aside. My faith is very important to me. I'm an everyday Bible reader. In Hungary, we don't really have this tradition of confessing our faith in public. Being among very few women national leaders, less than 20 in the world, I want to show a conservative narrative about what it means to be a woman politician. Sheridan writes, Novak is no fundamentalist, not someone imposing her values on others, but her public Christianity makes her, by Western European standards, an authentic radical. She's a strong Calvinist reformed Christian. Hungary wants to continue its Christian heritage. She's politely aghast at the way Hungary is caricatured in Western media. When my country and the Hungarian people are pictured as non-democratic and against freedom, it's very difficult to understand why people, most of whom have never been to Hungary, can have such a strong, clear misperception. So why does the international media so often get Hungary so wrong? She says, first, they don't understand the Hungarian language. Second, very often the Hungarian narrative doesn't fit into the mainstream liberal narrative. And third, we don't put enough effort into clarification. Much international media only want to hear certain types of stories about Hungary. At times, the left liberal international consensus from Brussels to Paris, from Berlin to the Guardian Bunkers of London, as well as the New York Times and universities across the West seem to assume if a nation doesn't embrace all the social values of San Francisco, it's automatically to be regarded as the Taliban. Whether the age of Hamas atrocities will change that is unclear. Conservatives across Europe are having surprising successes, especially where they're led by out and proud conservative women such as Italia's Georgia Milani, of whom Novak says, I have a very good personal friendship with Georgia, and what she's doing is very good for Italy. Sheridan writes, three themes emerge from conversation with Novak. The Hungarian commitment to human freedom, the need to bolster families and encourage more children, and Budapest's desire to remain culturally a country in the Christian tradition. This is not at the expense of religious freedom. Novak says, we Hungarians are freedom fighters. This is the anniversary of the 23rd of October Hungarian uprising against Soviet rule. For us, freedom is our inheritance. That goes to the exercise of faith. Everybody can freely exercise their faith in Hungary. We are historically a Christian country. We have an 1,100-year history as a Christian nation. Our first king chose Christianity for us as a reformed Christian. I would say we were predestined for Christianity. It's also cultural Christianity. We have Christian holidays, habits, literature, arts. Nowadays, many in the West thinking you can only be tolerant if you give up your national identity and your Christian identity. Novak wants Hungarian women and families to have real choice. She wants them to have choice of having children. She says young people want to have families. As a conservative woman leader, my question is why can't they? My role is to enable them to have families, not to coerce them. I never hear anyone regret having too many kids. By the way, 
I'm the second of six children. My mother and father never regretted having kids. At the end of their lives, nobody says, I wish I had more meetings at the office. This is my number one issue. We have to face reality. It's important to tackle the demographic challenge. No Western nation has a fertility rate at replacement level. No country in the EU, not the US, not Australia. Look at South Korea, one of the most successful countries economically. Its fertility rate has gone down to 0.8. Bear in mind that to maintain a population, this is my commentary here, you need to have 2.1 children per adult woman. As families minister, Novak worked to increase Hungary's fertility rate. It was 1.21 children per adult woman. In 2011, now it's 1.56, a big increase. Hungary devotes 6% of GDP to pro-family policies, including a provision that a family with four children pays no income tax for life. That's pretty good, huh? That's a real family-friendly policy. The Hungarian people, she says, don't consider mass immigration the solution to the democratic problems. The criticism of Hungary in terms of strict immigration policy, Novak says, is entirely consistent with and the same as Australia's. And she and Hungary says that having tight borders is what every nation must do. Novak also objects to the presentation of Hungary as some kind of ally of Russia. Quote, we condemn the Russian invasion of Ukraine, as other Hungarian ministers and political leaders have also told Sheridan. We've helped nearly 2 million Ukrainians, but we also want to get to a peace settlement as soon as possible. She then goes on about motherhood. I consider motherhood a privilege. It's a privilege that we can give birth to a child. Now, of course, we can decide to give that up, but I want to show motherhood as a good, as a privilege. We should strive for that. What I see is that younger girls and women always hear the message that they must compete with the man. They don't hear that they can cooperate with the man. Many university students tell me they're encouraged by my message not to be afraid of childbearing. I want to make them believe they're capable of that. Being a working mother is difficult, of course. As much as it's great for some women to dedicate their whole life to children, it's the duty of government to provide the opportunity to do both. I believe in real freedom of choice. She talked about Hungary welcoming Hungarians after the 56 uprising. Quote, I'm very grateful to Australia for welcoming Hungarian refugees and for giving them a second home. It's great to see them find such a welcoming place where they can exercise their rights fully. Though she doesn't try to impose her religious values, she takes religion profoundly seriously in her own life. Hungary has a big program to assist Christians in distress around the world. Finally, she says, for me, Christianity is where my strength and consciousness comes from. I know who I'm responsible to. Faith and children help you make decisions in the long run. Wonderful article. If you would like a copy of that article, I'm happy to email it to you. Ask me. It's worth reading. And there are some key lessons to learn from what I've just read to you. I know it's a little bit long for a reading, but they're important principles. Firstly, to have the courage to live life in accordance with your own faith and values. Make that decision. Kathleen Novak chose to do that, to live her life in accordance with faith and values. Secondly, she has the courage to speak her own truth. And thirdly, it's a great lesson in Hungary, having the courage as a nation and a government to push back against the majority views of Western European countries and of the mainstream media in the West, pushing a leftist liberal line. I'm in despair in the conservative parties in Australia about their unwillingness to align with anything Christian. It's, it's remarkable to me. I consider, I am raised a Catholic. I consider I am a Christian. I am, I embrace Christian values because they, I consider, are the foundation of Western civilization. The core essence of it is that each human being 
matters. What's the reward for having courage in these three ways? Well, the Hungarian government has spectacular positive election results. In the last four elections that Viktor Orban's government has won, but he won his first election in 1998, when he was just 37, he was prime minister for four years, lost the next two elections, and then he won the elections in 2010, 2014, 2018, 22, and every time with a majority in excess of 65%, numbers that the Australian, any Australian government would, would be just amazed by. Secondly, Hungary is one of is is the safest and securest nation in Europe. The government has maintained control. It's controlled its immigration. Orban has spoken out against the Muslim invasion of many European cities and the lack of safety for many people in those cities, but the mainstream media does not talk about it. And thirdly, Kotlin Novak's reward for being courageous to speak her truth is that she's the president of a nation at the age of 46. Pretty impressive. So let me share quickly some resources for you to think about today's big idea of the principles that Kotalin Novak shared. Well, my recommended book is any book that you look up on, on Google about Hungary. There are so many interesting books on the history of Hungary. I didn't want to recommend any one to you. If you want to read a book about Hungary, take your pick. This week is not a song, lyrics that I'm going to share with you, but some Hungarian music. Franz Liszt, L-I-S-Z-T, a wonderful Hungarian composer of the 19th century, and I'll, I'll share with you one piece. He wrote numerous Hungarian rhapsodies, Hungarian Rhapsody number 15. Listen to that, the Rákóczi March, and go marching off and get motivated to, to live your life with passion. My spiritual tip is to meditate on the times when you have exercised courage, when you have made a decision to go against the majority, when you have made a decision to speak your truth. When you access your courage, that courage comes from your soul, from your spirit, from your heart. That's the etymology of the word courage, kur, meaning heart. My health tip is to understand the difference between alkaline and acidic foods. The ideal pH level for your body, says Robert O. Young, is 7.35. Well, please take a constant interest into whether you're eating acidic foods or alkaline foods. There are plenty of charts available online to make that decision. My quote is from Viktor Orban, the current Prime Minister of Hungary, who's now... 61, uh, 61 years of age, he became Prime Minister for the first time at 37. He says this about Hungary, pushing back against the leftist liberal narrative. This is our homeland, our life. And since we don't have another one, we will fight for it. Till the very end. And we will never give it up. That's commitment. That's what the Hungarian government is doing. I commend it for doing so. And now a spot of humour. And I thought I would share some, I would share some uh, principles on how you know you're Hungarian. I mean, some of you know Hungarians. There are some Hungarians, Hungarian origin people. Well, whilst I'm, whilst I was born in Australia, I speak fluent Hungarian, and I've been hungry many times. So there are some very very humorous characteristics of Hungarians. These are some of those that make me laugh. So here we go. Hungarian. You know you're Hungarian when you use sour cream more than tomato sauce. Nobody can properly pronounce your last name. Nobody can properly pronounce your first name. Sausages hanging in your grandfather's car repair shop is normal. Paprika pronounced paprika in Hungarian. Paprika is just as important as salt and pepper on the table and in food. You drink palinka at every meal. Palinka is a famous Hungarian spirit. You know you're Hungarian when you know the phrase three is the Hungarian truth. 
That was often quoted to me when I was successfully married for the third time to Julie. So there you are. Three is the Hungarian truth. And lastly, people want to show off by saying that they know your capital, Bucharest. And no, they're not joking. Anyway, it's wonderful to be a Hungarian. I love my heritage. I'm Australian and with a Hungarian heritage, I'm proud of that. And I, I commend you to observe the fight for freedom and Hungary's history about its fight for freedom for its existence. I say that's what we have to do now. That's why I'm a freedom warrior, to preserve Western civilization, to preserve our inalienable rights. Take the steps to use today's big idea to reinforce for yourself the steps you take to live life on your terms. And what your terms are is a function of your ever-increasing levels of self-awareness, self-knowledge, and your willingness to pursue your passion. I invite you to subscribe to this YouTube channel, Rumble channel, or to the podcast if you like it. Share it with your family and friends and work colleagues. Visit our websites, covest.com, charlescovest.com. My books, Passionate People Produce and Passionate Performance, are available at those websites and also the programs that are available to be run for corporates and individuals, including executive coaching. Now, let's review some key happenings over the past week. I interviewed Karen Fox on my TNT radio show. That radio show is every week on tntradio.live. Karen warned us about the activities of the World Health Organization its proposed changes to the international health regulations and the threats to Australia's and each country's sovereignty in having an unelected bureaucrat like Ted Ross, the head of the WHO, imposing a pandemic without evidence and then each country losing its rights to do what it wants to do. This is a grave danger to sovereignty. I consider a grave danger. I push back against it and... Her website that she's helping with, an, that she's put together with a number of other people, is most instructive called Australia Exits the Who.com. During the week, the Labor government in Australia, when it's finally admitted the impossibility of its net zero strategies, is going to double down on the nonsense about climate emergency, destroy farmlands, destroy seas, put massive, massive debt onto Australians for this madness of heading to net zero. It's a fraud. I've told you before, I love the planet, but climate, there is no climate emergency. We have a soil emergency. We have chemicals in soil that emergency. We have water waste. So we have a water emergency. We have waste emergency. There's no climate emergency. Labor government all governments around the world that say that there is are implementing the wishes of the global cabal for a one world government. And that's what the Israel Hamas fight is all about. Another distraction saying, oh, we have to solve the problems of the world. Let's have one world government. I say, no, I want you to think about, it. do you want one world government, an unelected body, just like the UN, just like the World Health Organization, I don't. And lastly, the most important thing about what's happening is, of course, it's Melbourne Cup Day. On Tuesday, the 7th of November, a public holiday in Victoria, or in parts of Victoria, a nation almost stops for this race, this two-mile, 3.2-kilometre race, Famous, famous race, the Melbourne Cup. So Melbourne news is awash with thoroughbred horse racing. It's a good place to be. Cup day is a big day. And this week, the weather is finally going to get warm. So much for global warming, everybody. So if you're new to the show, stick around where I cover now the foundational principles of the show and further details of my background, if that's of interest to you. Thanks for watching and listening. And until our next show, may your week be full of passion, full of challenge, full of joy when you embrace the gift of life that you and I have. Have a great week. See you next week. Bye. And now... 
for viewers and listeners who want to know more about my background and what else I do with my life as well as the foundational principles of the show. Here we are. Since 1993, when I left my legal career, a career that I love to become Australasia's passion provocateur, I have inspired and provoked and educated and motivated people all over the world to discover and pursue their passion. I have helped people via the books that I've written, via speeches at conferences, via in-depth team building programs, workshops, over one, two or three days or over three months, six months. And I've coached people of all ages, one-on-one -on -one from small, medium and large enterprises, government enterprises, helping them to identify the often tiny changes that can make a massive difference. One of my core principles is that freedom is what makes us truly human. That's why one of the th greatest threats that government imposes on you to force you to observe its laws is the threat of imprisonment, the loss of your freedom. Just think about that. Government says, if you don't behave yourself, we're gonna put you in jail. No, no, I don't wanna go to jail. I don't wanna lose my freedom. That's a reminder to you of why freedom is so important. Without freedom, you and I are not much different to animals. If you were locked up in a cage for the rest of your life, how, how different would you be to an animal? This commitment to fighting for freedoms for all people is carried out by me th made primarily through five channels. Number one, preserving the freedom to pursue your passion. Number two, inspiring you to be able to be free through excellent health. Number three, helping preserve freedom throughout the world through the expansion of industrial hemp a magnificent agricultural crop, an almost miraculous crop that enables every community to thrive independently of government. In this way, the power of government to take away freedom is minimized. Number four, fighting for freedom through legal strategies. So I do work as a legal strategy consultant, as an interface between clients and their lawyers. And number five, as chairman of the Australian Institute of Comedy and as a board member of the Australian Cartoon Museum, fighting for the freedom of thought and speech through uncensored comedy and humour, through avoiding political correctness in the comedic space. When you block freedom of speech, freedom of thought, that's the beginning of the end of your freedoms. The foundational principles for the Charles Covey Show are founded on the formula SA plus P equals S. Your self-awareness added to your passion will guarantee that you are successful. And the best definition of success I have found in life is that success is the progressive realization of your worthy ideals. The progressive realization of your worthy ideals. This show is also guided by Socrates' famous principle and quote, the unexamined life is not worth living. You can see I'm wearing my red jacket. I wear my red jacket for all my shows. Red is the color of passion. So that when you see me on the YouTube version, it reminds you that when you see red in your life, you ask yourself the question, am I pursuing my passion? What am I passionate about? Am I still passionate about that? What might I newly be passionate about? Each week I explore one big idea that can change your life. And it's just one big idea because there's a chance you will remember it. If I give you too many ideas, then we, we get confused and we don't do anything. Clarity leads to power. Confusion kills passion. Each week I share simple and practical resources that you've heard me describe in the earlier part of the show. A spiritual tip, a health tip, lyrics of a song, a book, a quote and of course humor this show is not politically correct i have no intention of being politically correct and i love certain addictions including my addiction to great coffee mm. my addiction to exercise my addiction to reading and my addiction to certain other unmentionable in public type behaviors who would know what they are
this show definitely subscribes to the view that we have a spiritual life. So if you don't like discussion of spirituality, this show is not for you. I promise you that I don't include anything in this show that I don't consider to be true and that I have not found to be useful in the work that I've done over the past 28 years, but also over the past 50 years in business, as a lawyer, as a consultant advisor. I only want to share stuff with you that is of value to you. Finally, if you have any questions or suggestions, please feel free to contact me at charles at Again, thanks for watching and listening to my show. Bye.